Hi, everyone. Welcome to Master the World. We're so excited to have you here today. It's a Monday. It's not our regular webinar day, but I'm just going to give everybody uh, some time to get in. My name is Lee Ming Stro. I am the co-founder and CEO of Master the World here in sunny uh, Healdsburg, California, where Master the World is, can be found, uh, where we do our remodeling. Uh, again, welcome to everyone. Welcome to Master the World. We're talking about Kit 127A. And I'm going to introduce everybody else on the panel while we're waiting for everyone to come. Evan Goldstein. Evan, where are you today? Today, I am in my uh, dining room in San Francisco, and the weather is gorgeous. I hate, I, I, I have to say that, you know, you know, you know that song, It Never Rains in Southern California? You know, it never rains. It, now it never rains in California anymore. We got like test stuff. I'm starting to worry. This climate change stuff is crazy. But I'm actually happy that we're to be here today and happy that we're doing this on a Monday. What a great way to start off a week. Absolutely. All right, Madeline, where are you calling in from? I'm from uh, Metro Detroit, specifically Southgate, which is uh, my beloved uh, suburb south of uh, Detroit proper, en route to Toledo. And we are having crazy, glorious Michigan weather, bright sunshine. It was in the 20s yesterday, and it's up to 45 today. Yay. Very awesome. happy to be here and to see you all. Of course. And Tim, this Monday, we find you in New Mexico. Yeah, and the teeming megapolis of Rio Rancho, which is near <laughs> Albuquerque, if you don't know. New Mexico is one of the few license plates in the country, by the way, that has USA, because a lot of people <laughs> don't know that. That's actually true. But uh, today, weather-wise, you know, it snowed last Wednesday and was really cold in the single digits uh, at night for a couple nights, but we're up to 60 today, and it's sunny, and it's going to be spring soon, and I can't wait for spring. Great. Well, tell us where you guys are calling in from. Love to see it. I'm really excited because some of you were getting last minute kits shipped to you and seeing you here. I'm hoping that that means that you've got your kits. So again, I'm Lee Ming Stro. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Master the World. I'm here in sunny California, here in Healdsburg, California, where you can find Master the World's winery. Uh, and of course, for those of you just joining us, Madeline Trafon, Tim Gazer and Evan Goldstein, and we're gonna get the show started. Uh, we are tasting 127A today. Uh, if you wanna join the leaderboard, that's CW72. Please do not be afraid to ask questions. Uh, since the beginning, when we had this formal sort of Q&A thing, I think we've kind of just taken questions in the chat and it's kind of a preferred way now, it keeps the conversation going. So if you wanna throw in your questions, please drop it into the chat we'll answer as we go along. I'll be curating the questions. And if for some reason we're not able to answer right away, we will answer at the happy half hour. Uh, virtual hugs, hellos, always encouraged and welcome. Make sure you select all attendees and panelists to everyone when you share comments. Evan, Madeline and I and Tim, we get to see everybody's comments, but sometimes when people forget to share it with everyone, uh, everybody else doesn't get to see your comments. And then of course, uh, we have a new feature, what's in my kit. If you wanted to see what's in my kit, you can always use this what's in my kit link over here. It's also a QR code that comes with your sheets now. If you QR code this, it shows you what's in your kit and you can do what we call a single blind tasting, meaning all the wines are listed for you alphabetically but it's not listed in the correct order. So for those of you who find our kits a little bit difficult, you can have that and then have at trying to guess which one is which as you taste along. And of course, all tasting notes are on there as well. So without further ado, I want to kick off the first wine. Uh, we have six wines to get through in about an hour and a half. And after that, we'll stay on for any additional questions. Madeline, you're up. Okay, cheers everyone to your good health first and foremost and your good cheer secondly. So uh, picking up wine number one, um, you know, I can't overstate how, uh, you know, to slam through the appearance, you're just doing yourself a disservice, especially if uh, you are learning how to taste deductively, but also so you don't cheat yourself out of uh, an important element of the wine. And when I hold this against a white surface on an angle, it is clearly um, 
pale straw with green glints and it's silvered at the rim. So it's setting us up for something that appears to be um, quite young and fresh. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and discuss both the fragrance and the flavor together. But, uh, oh, by the way, these questions to consider up here, you can pay attention to them, to them or not. There's something for your mind to chew on if that's helpful. Um, I would say that um, the third point, what makes a wine taste ripe and tart at the same time is very interesting and worth keeping in your subconscious as you taste along. And uh, the alcohol is just to get yourself in the habit of being able to quantify structural elements um, independent of one another. Okie dokie. So aromatically and on the palate. Aromatically, the first thing that strikes me is just wonderful fresh snipped herbs, particularly parsley for me. And you know, the presence of uh, green is distinctive in this wine. You might think a little bit of grass, a little bit of green olive. Um, the fruit, if I can, you know, circle back to that a moment because we get in the habit of considering fruit first is all about citrus right up front, particularly ripe lemon and uh, maybe a little bit of key lime. Yeah, a whisper of white grapefruit on this. And then I'm gonna go ahead and take it on the palate before I um, uh, qualify it more. I love it how some of my colleagues make a point of saying that you shouldn't um, um, make gurgly noises when you're tasting, but I love to do it, you know, because it reminds us to connect our sense of smell to our sense of taste. The palate is actually, um, there's a little disc, bit of a disconnect, not in a negative way, between the nose and the palate. The palate has explosive um, citrusy fruit and uh, poignant acidity and also quite a bit of white grapefruit coming through. Um, the acidity, I'm gonna quantify it a little early because it is pulling my attention. It is medium plus on a bad day, but definitely high today. Um, and it's very much mouthwatering. Uh, going back to the fruit aromatics and flavor, uh, if we're talking about tree fruit, definitely tart apple. So green apple, uh, maybe, uh, well, I'm going to leave it at that. If we're talking about stone fruit, probably underripe yellow plum, but there's also a presence of tropical fruit a little bit in the background. It's not a strong element, but I would say maybe a little, a little bit of mango and melon, but it doesn't sweeten the wine. It brings a ripeness to it that's very pleasant indeed. And there's definitely a floral aromatic to this. Once you push past the citrus, um, you get... Uh, I would say lime blossom, you know, citrus blossom. So definitely the theme of uh, citrus is uh, present both aromatically and on the palate. There is a little bit of uh, an inorganic earth reflection on this wine, and I would say a salinity to it. You know, I always love it when a mouth, when a wine makes my mouth water with its acidity um, and then has a little bit of an illusion of salt to it too. Um, so strong herbal element, uh, grass and parsley and fresh snipped herbs, strong citrus element, mouthwatering, long, and there's a richness to this wine. It's got to wait. If you go back to it after your first approach and your palate has adjusted to the acidity, there's um, almost uh, an oiliness to it underneath the acidity. So highly aromatic, refreshing, but rich and quite, quite long. I we're going to start. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to start putting the poll out as Madeline's talking. We're going to, as any of our educators are talking, Andrew's going to actually put the poll up uh, so that you can have some time to ponder what this is. Uh, just for you to um, have an Amen. easier what way if, of answering. Amen. What if nobody's been on this before? What if there's some new people here who are a little curious as to what you're talking about? Maybe give them just a hint of background. Uh, absolutely, um, Evan. So. If I have to go on mute because there's some background noise, please take over. I but I would just want to make sure that everyone knows this is an anonymous poll. So you can guess along. Uh, it helps you understand, you know, where, um, where, what, what choices you have and a narrower view into what's going on here uh, in your glass. 
and we have four choices for grapes, uh, four choices for regions. And if you're not sure, or if you had something else in mind, let us know what else you were thinking. That other category is actually really important in helping us understand where you were going. And I will add to that to be, you know, um, this is this is a safe zone. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. Quite honestly, if you have something other in mind that you honestly are perceiving, you're helping other people who are thinking it and are not expressing it. And it helps us with uh, the whole deductive exercise. Why this? Why not that? So, you know, please be honest with yourself and with us because it's useful. And uh, so I can go ahead and address this sli slide, Li Meng. Absolutely. Uh, you, you did bring up a really good question as we are waiting for the last people to answer the poll. Uh, please, again, don't be shy. I only see 50% of people participating, which means that you're a little shy. Uh, and I think, Madeline, just this whole acid and ripe thing, how does that work in wine? No, absolutely, because you can absolutely have a wine that's very high in acidity and a wine that's got a very ripe um, character to it. You can be in a growing region that's got blazing sunlight and an extended growing season. So you get all sorts of ripe character in the fruit, but you can also be either um, at high altitude or have a strong maritime influence or diurnal swings, which will add to the um, acidity level being poignant. And what do we have here? Albarino, Pinot Gris, Sauvignon Blanc. So Sauvignon Blanc, highly aromatic, Albarino, um, I would say can be highly aromatic. Uh, Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, a little bit more neutral, but if that's what this wine is speaking to you, don't be shy in saying that. And a couple of old world and new world options, which will be influenced very much by what grape variety you are scooching towards. If you are picking other, let us know what other you're picking uh, so that we can see and Madeline can help explain how it is or isn't. Uh, I'm gonna end the poll right now and share the results. Ah, very lovely. So we've got um, almost an even split between Albariño, Albariño and Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc blend, which uh, inevitably includes uh, Muscadel or, or Semillon if we're in Bordeaux for sure, with good to be honest with yourselves, a Pinot Gris Grigio um, contingent. And if you can put what other you were considering in the chat room, that would be dynamite. So we've got, um, I'm trying to see if I can't see on my screen. Uh, oh, Suave, terrific. And That's then we've guess. got, yeah. um, what, an even split between Old World and New World, Spain, Italy, Oregon, which must be the Pinot Gris contingent. And then we've got a hat tip to South America and uh, other, which is not Suave if it belongs to Italy. So that's interesting. Anyway, you can see this is not a on off thing. You know, we think about things um, differently when we're coming to deductive conclusions uh, individually and together. So I think we should reveal the wine. Oh, this is my favorite one. When we take our first trip around the world, we are going to mm. grab to the people who ended up in Chile. We are very close to the Pacific Ocean. We are in um, uh, uh, Chile. We are exactly west of Santiago. Uh, the grapes for this come from the larger Aconcagua um, area within that San Antonio, uh, AKA Leida. And uh, we are talking, yes, Sauvignon Blanc. Have we revealed uh, the label yet? Uh, and so there you see where ah, uh, Amaina, which I love because it is an indigenous uh, phrase. We're not entirely sure which uh, indigenous Indian group it comes from, but it means the calm after the storm, which my friend Evan Goldstein defined as that ominous yet peaceful feeling that you only experience around the ocean. Bravo for that. It is, um, I believe, 100% Sauvignon Blanc from the statistics I'm looking at. It is very uh, fresh. You know, I it's 2020, but I would have guessed even fresher than that. Ergo, the option uh, that would have been accepted is 2022. And um, it is from a producer who originally um, had a property in Leda that centered on grain and lamb production, and they haven't um, released wine until the year 2000, um, when the owner, my, winemaker Matias uh, Gar Garces, I'm undoubtedly slaughtering the pronunci pronunciation, Silva, uh, decided to bottle. But I strongly suggest you go to their website because uh, 
even closer shots of the winery are very impressive indeed. Um, they make Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. I think that's it. So we're talking about, uh, and here he is, uh, young and handsome with a friend and two doggies in the vineyards. And we're talking about an area that is very much, much, influ much influenced by the Pacific. Um, so we've got some altitude going on, but we um, have a maritime influence there at 750 feet above sea level. Not a very large production marches into this country, 4,200 cases, but I wanna mention something that just fascinated the hell out of me. The alcohol is claimed to be 14 and a half, 14 to 14 and a half, but look at that poignant acidity. So, you know, quite often we might mistakenly assume that high acid, um, cool climate, you know, moderate to low alcohol, au contraire. And I would say in considering this particular wine, if you're doing it deductively, you know, try to position yourself in the new world or the old world. And certainly that minerality might um, have you consider the old world, but you know, we'll, we're all gonna be reminded that uh, new world has plenty of terroir expression that comes through as mineral, rock, uh, salinity, seashell and such. And um, Alexander, Alpha, hmm? oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, oh, I was gonna I was say- I just gonna say Ale mm -hmm. Alexander here um, sent it to the panelists, but he had a really good guess, which was Bordeaux Blanc, uh, where they use Sauvignon Blanc. How would you distinguish between a Bordeaux Blanc and a Sauvignon Blanc from Chile? You know, if I were thinking about, and I love white Bordeaux at all price points, because they can range from very modest to very expensive indeed, but inevitably you're going to have a significant amount of either Semillon and or Muscadel. The Semillon will change um, the mouthfeel for sure. The acidity tends to be less poignant. Um, if the white Bordeaux is on the more expensive side, it will generally have an expression of oak um, from, if not barely, uh, barrel fermentation, barrel aging. But I think this is really a glorious example of ripe, you know, um, very forward in terms of its varietal expression. Sauvignon Blanc, and I would encourage you to uh, play with your own common sense and thinking, why not New Zealand? Why not North, Cal uh, uh, North Coast California? Why is it Chile? And I will remind us all that, you know, Chile is not as well known for uh, Sauvignon Blanc as it is for Cabernet Sauvignon, but it probably damn well should be. And I would also add that New Zealand, to me, will have a little bit more of a candied and almost green beanie character to it. And uh, Napa and Sonoma will be a little bit broader, not quite as poignant in the acidity and possibly have a little bit of background of oak. Would my colleagues like to add anything to that? Tim? Well, you know, I, I was actually typing an answer for Colleen. So, you know, what takes me to Chile here is a combination of things, uh, you know, a lot of ripe fruit, there's definitely tart fruit but the, the elevated alcohol, and certainly there's a mineral character to it, but not nearly as pronounced as you would find in places like, uh, you know, Bordeaux or Sancerre. And then finally, to Madeline's point, you know, if this was Bordeaux Blanc, odds are it would have at least used oak, if not a certain percentage mm -hmm. of new oak. So fruit ripeness, elevated alcohol, and lack of mineral, really in very pyrogenic, uh, take me to Chile usually. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we and, have two the questions here. On this are more, are more well mannered. I'm sorry, go ahead, Luming. <laughs> okay, so two questions here. One is, and I think Evan was trying to come in. So, Evan, if you can answer this question, how would Australian Riesling differ from this particular wine? Uh, well, I'm happy to I'm happy to jump in here, but I know Madeline will have a lot to say. Uh, you know, when you get Australian Riesling, first of all, you're going to get, um, as is usually the case in young Australian Riesling, be it from you know the Clare Valley, be it from um, Eden Valley or whatever, it's going to have a much more petrolly character to it. That's sort of part of their standard thing that comes from the TDN. Um, in that which you get with um, extensive sunshine um, and um, that sort of touching the fruit, which you find more in Alsace, I mean, in uh, Australia than you would say in Alsace 
or Germany where that flavor develops over time. It's not as, uh, as um, uh, imbued initially as it is. But you're also not gonna find as much green character. I think both Tim and Madeline pointed out that um, you do have these green elements. I, I would uh, concur with Madeline in the sense that I find it to be more herbal in nature and green in nature, but not being sort of um, two jalapeno green bell right. pepper-ish uh, there, which would be more in that sort of truly pyrazinic uh, character for those people that know pyrazines or what make green bell peppers taste like, well, green bell peppers. And they diminish as the pepper goes from green to orange and then orange, obviously, to red where they go out all together. Jalapenos, serranos, all of those will have more of that. The other thing that you can often find um, with certain styles of uh, Sauvignon Blanc are going to be much more of those pronounced uh, citrus fruits. And usually grapefruit to me is what uh, sticks out in California, uh, more pink grapefruit in the warmer areas, more white grapefruit in the cooler areas, but it's usually fairly pronounced um, in, in the part of the world, which we would call New Zealand. It gets to be a little bit more in that sort of uh, gooseberry, elderflower uh, kind of nature, a little bit more uh, passion fruity or something like that. But Chile to me almost always comes off green and herbal like, like this one does. Uh, in varying stages, uh, the closer you get uh, to the water, generally the greener and more pungent that will become the warmer areas. It will tend to be more uh, like what you find in California. Um, Casablanca, probably where most people are associating Sauvignon Blanc from in Chile, tends to be greener towards the coast. And as you get towards the Andes Mountain in the eastern part of Casablanca, it tends to be very uh, grapefruity. So a lot of it is going to be, be dependent on where you are. But the other element that I just wanted to point out, I'll quiet down in a second, is when compared to that comment about Bordeaux, is Bordeaux is always going to be a blend. Um, and so you're going to have more of a choir-esque character where this is being a pure 100% variety, very much speaks with a singular voice. And that is a voice of green herbal, uh, grassy, olivey, whatever you want to call it, um, personality. With ripe and tart, um, you know, characteristics. Honest to God, I am so impressed with the quality of this wine, and this is the first time I've tasted it. I encourage you to memorize it, because mm -hmm. I think it's a great example of, mm -hmm. um, of Chilean Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, the other... I, I, I think it's... Go ahead. Sorry, Evan, we have to keep on time, no, so... Well, I'll use that as my segue into wine too. The other thing that I think Madeline pointed out that is worth um, um, spending some time on is if you get Sauvignon Blanc and it's got that new world personality, and if you're kind of leaning towards Chile, but you're not sure where, that sort of oilier textured element is a trademark of San Antonio and a particular trademark mm. of Leda. So if you ever find that sort of unctuousness there where somebody might take it to Bordeaux, but to Madeline's point, you don't have the wood. Um, San Antonio Valley in Aconcagua is a good place to go. So anyway, we switch gears now and we move into wine two. Right off the bat, if you hold it side by side with, with wine one, and if you have the luxury, of course, of having your, your six wines um, poured side by side in six different glasses, or even if you're doing the whites and then the reds, um, take an opportunity, as Madeline said, to not just sort of jump over the visuals, but to look at them. Whereas that first wine was sort of strawish, and with little green tints here, this wine is definitely more in that sort of yellow gold vein. Um, the uh, greenness is sort of evaporated away uh, over time because I think the wine is starting to show, be dominated by, by a, this sort of deeper, richer color, which would be a combination perhaps of a little bit of age, but also perhaps a combination of, of, of lifestyle. Uh, wines pick up color from three places. Obviously they darken as they get older, um, they can darken uh, if they are given contact with the skins and they can darken in the presence of oak. We don't know anything more at this point in time, but that's something worth mentioning. As I swirl it around here, um, I'm finding that it, it definitely uh, clings up top. The legs are fall, falling sort of moderately, but they've got some thickness to them. So that suggests a wine that definitely has some good extract and some uh, good things there, lots going on. Um, as I smell the wine, one of the things I'm always taken back on where we spend so much time, particularly if you're doing the full workout here, going through the micro uh, dis dissection of what kind of citrus fruit and what kind of tree fruit, is oftentimes just ask yourself the basics. Get, you know, can I find a few things? Few is a wonderful, memorizable thing to look for fruit, look for earth, and look for wood. And generally, if you can discuss those three elements, um, in a wine with anybody, you're going to have more than enough to, to, to look at. So right off the bat, always a good idea to keep some of these um, 
questions uh, lo located down there in the lower left that we'll come back to before we, we move slides. Um, I'm struck right off the bat by a wonderful um, ripeness of fruit character. And here I'm getting sort of a panoply of flavors. I'm getting um, citrus on the riper side of citrus, uh, for sure. So more in that sort of like orangish, mandarinish vein, but really more driven by orchard fruit. Here I'm getting um, apples and really particularly really juicy, um, sweet yellow golden apples, maybe um, uh, even pushing towards uh, juicier pears, green and yellow pears brown pears, strong undercurrent of tropicality here, a little bit of perhaps a, a soft pineapple or, um, or a melony character. And I, I tend to put melons in tropical. I know that's not right, but I just sort of do. Maybe a little bit of guava, maybe a little bit of uh, green mango, but definitely some tropicality here. So that covers all of my fruit stuff. There are um, for sure elements of uh, florals here, I'm getting a lot of white flowers. And again, sort of some more of those citrusy flowers that Madeline alluded to earlier. Um, not getting so much anything vegetable, because again, when I say fruit, that's anything that grows out of the, the ground. Maybe a touch of camel meal, maybe a touch of verbena in the wine, um, nothing otherwise super green or herbal. Um, and then as we moved on to earth, I am getting some minerality here. Um, it's not sort of more in that sort of really strong old world slaty kind of vein, but there's definitely some, some turned earth um, and, and a very soft sense of, uh, of minerality as well. But the thing we do have to worry about here, which gets back to what we talked about earlier, um, and I wouldn't say worry about it, worry is a bad thing, but consider here, it's probably a better term, would be oak. Uh, and there's definitely oak here. It was alluded to in the darker, richer color. And then it comes off in the nose here where I'm getting uh, notes of, of, of toasted nuts. I'm getting notes of uh, some sweet, soft baking spices. I'm picking up just a little bit of uh, a very ha a faint hint of vanilla in the wine. Um, but once again, sort of this toasted nutty thing. And then the oak in concert with the riper fruit is giving me almost this like crumble or apple pie-ish thing. And then um, the slough, the sort of, sort of uh, caramelized note in here reminds me of like, I don't know, like flan or creme brulee or, or something like that. Lots going on here, generous fruit, deft use of oak, beautifully structured, and now we taste. The wine here has a very lovely attack. It comes at you in waves. So initially you're getting all this generosity of fruit. Then you're getting this wonderful, um, very intentionally driven structure of the wine that suggests a longer growing season because it finishes very crisp, very fresh, very bright, uh, which is interesting given the weight of the wine because it definitely comes off to me as a fuller, fuller bodied wine. The nature of the ripeness that you need to get to get things like peaches and apples and all that ripe and that sort of generosity of, uh, of texture. In the mouth, it is creamy. It is round. Um, it is smooth. I wouldn't necessarily call it buttery per se, unless you're speaking to that very soft character that you would get in like pie pastry or something like that. It's not a buttery wine. It's not like buttered popcorn or anything like that. Um, it's long. The alcohol in it is, is definitely present. I'm feeling it in my chest cavity right now. There's nothing um, phenolic about the wine. Again, it's just beautiful fruit. It's long. It's expansive. Um, it's a pretty good example of what it is. So why don't we go take that into where in the world is Carmen San Diego today? Got a couple of choices for you. Um, looking, looking at our, our options here as the poll pops up. It could be Chardonnay, and Chardonnay obviously is a wine that, that expresses a number of the characters we talked about before. I would suggest Pinot Gris rather than Grigio because more of those sort of um, richer uh, textured versions of a Pinot Gris could probably verge similarly texturally to what we talked about here. Torrentes is that incredibly perfumed aromatic uh, grape that many of us know and sort of uh, remind you of when you drive your car into a fruit stand in Hawaii and then end up with plumeria all over your neck. Um, and then obviously associate those specific regions with that particular grape, depending on whether you felt it was very new worldish in personality or old worldish in personality. And if you wanna go off the trailhead and pick something else, do feel empowered and encouraged to plop your thoughts in there because again, ideas that you may have um, are wonderful fodder for us to have conversations about and um, learn and teach and educate and get some, uh, some feedback going. So. I just wanna also add, uh, there was a question here from Gary. 
mm -hmm. uh, about being a newbie to the world of blind tasting, uh, just past level two, working on level three, you know, how would you recommend that I use these kids as I get started tasting blind? Should I open label at least for a while until I have an idea what to look for? Evan, what's your, what's your best bet hit? Yeah, I mean, everyone's going to approach blind tasting in a different way. You know, some people like to go in completely as we are doing today, blind, which is to say you're not knowing the grape, you're not knowing the country, you're not going to, re to know the region, and to really let your own tasting experiences help guide you into making choices. Um, obviously, if you're feeling new and you're not feeling the comfort zone of, of doing that yet, um, that might be a little bit daunting, in which case taking a semi-blind approach, which would be using that uh, QR code and popping up and at least seeing what the six wines are in the kit without necessarily noticing or noting which wine is which, and then simply connecting the dots. Okay, if one of these wines is this, which one is it probably closest to and all that? So literally just make a connection to the dots thing and then learning from that as you um, get them right and as you make the mistakes. If you're really truly beginning and you don't even have um, a sense yet of, of feeling good about that, then probably um, take comfort in the fact that these wines are curated for being really good examples of what they are and um, eschew the blind element altogether. Rip the uh, sleeve off the wine, know exactly what it is. And as you're tasting it, as Madeline said, you know, start hitting the save button in your brain to uh, allow some of these particular variety grapes and variety grape geographies to, um, to save become files. Mm -hmm. And if we actually say this is worth memorizing, we mean it. So <laughs> you know, we're not just up there to be chatty. We just mean it's a great example of type that the core elements of the wine, be it structure and fruit, what have you, are you know going to be your friends and trying to deduce. Yeah. And I will just add one last thing. Uh, part of the QR code is that you can actually see the tasting note. And when you log in and you submit your answers, you can see the tasting note. And one of the reasons why these bottles are 187 ml. Uh, we tried when we first started, you know, looking at 50, 100, and we figured that people need to go back. They can't just taste once. And sometimes if you put a little bit of spirits of private preserve, it's a can of uh, inert gas that Malin's holding up. You can go back to it in a few <laughs> days and blind yourself again. And just pour yourself those wines, have somebody else pour it for you. Um, I found it personally a great way to learn about the wines that we're tasting you guys on. So without further ado, Evan, uh, we're looking at this. I love, this is the task for the people out there. People are super confident in new world here. Mm, what yeah. about this world makes it new world for well, those I, of you out there? Yeah, I think that the um, the forwardness of the fruit, the ripeness of the fruit, um, obviously things are in the state of flux as we deal with climate change and vintages that are hotter than hell, uh, literally <laughs> happening in Europe now, changing the profiles. But traditionally, when you have um, the these extraordinarily forward fruited wines um, with uh, the accompanying alcohol, because obviously um, much riper fruit equals more sugar, more sugar equals more alcohol, generosity of texture, body and richness. It's gonna usually skew you um, towards, uh, towards the new world. Although of course there are warm places in the old world and cool places in the new world. But I think that that makes sense. The interesting mix of uh, varieties that we saw there said that there was a little bit of a camp for everybody, but let's figure out, find out where we are and then we can talk it through. So as we uh, get back into Google Earth spinning around, Gonna hold the table here so I don't get vertigo. I'm not really good with these things. We're staying in the northern hemisphere. We're moving from, to, from the uh, southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, but we're staying in the New World, in the Americas. And here we are landing um, in the serenity and in the absolute beauty of uh, Monterey County's uh, northern uh, Santa Lucia Highlands. So for those of you who are not familiar with this part of the world, this is literally part and parcel of Monterey County. Monterey County sits um, dead in the northern part of the central coast as you go south to Santa Cruz, but before you hit um, Paso Robles and Santa Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara County. And it is really one of the great um, uh, vegetable and fruit baskets of the country. We used to think of that as being further north towards the Silicon Valley, where now the only thing that's left there is silicon chips. But still in the bread basket here, this is where the lion's share of, gosh, broccoli and lettuce and so many vegetables come from. A lot of great fruit comes from here. But the Santa Lucia Highlands is wine country. And it's hard to picture here, but that little strip that you can see on your map, um, as you're driving from San Francisco um, down to um, 
San Luis Obispo or, or LA or whatever, you'll hit this path and as you're driving down the road and you look off to the right hand side, because you'll see 101 here um, is situated. So if you're driving south, you'd be looking to the right. You literally see this strip of land that's less than 20 miles long that has hillsides that um, remind you as you go from the flatland um, where River Road is up into the hillsides, it literally looks like Burgundy's Coat Door. And it literally, the vineyards sit on the hillsides as you move up, you have that slope thing, and it is close, as close to Burgundy as we get. Now, the reason why nobody's ever heard of it before is there's not a lot down there besides the vineyards. You know, Mon Monterey and Carmel Valley, which are a good 30 or 40 minutes away, are the closest metro areas, and San Francisco is further south. But I would encourage you, um, to really spend some time and discover this unexpected gem, this jewel, the, um, the, the uh, you know, one of the greatest areas. You probably even know it because a lot of people bring Santa Lucia fruit into their wineries, but are not actually bottling it down there. There's only a handful of wineries there, of which McIntyre is one of them. Um, Steve McIntyre, uh, whose uh, namesake winery this is, runs it's a family business. His daughter, uh, Kristen, uh, works with them and they're both on today's call. And I'm gonna ask Steve to join us in our happy half hour later to talk to us a little bit more. You can ask all the questions you want here. But um, I have a couple of, uh, of known bromances in the world of wine in California. People who have been on this show before know that um, Jason Drew is one of mine. Um, I would put Steve McIntyre right up there in the other one. Steve is, um, probably the most knowledgeable person on um, what's going on in, in the Highlands, Franklin in Monterey County than anybody I know. He's um, single-handedly responsible for having um, or overseeing roughly some 16,000 acres of fruit in this part of the world. He has his namesake winery and anybody who's anybody from God, Lucia to Gary's to uh, Rat to whoever, all deal, you know, all worship as I do, Steve, for really being single-handedly the person um, who's helped shape viticulture and wine growing in this part of the world. The vineyard that he works at is Namesake Winery, uh, which is about halfway down um, the valley, about 60 acres in total, uh, was first planted before he picked it up in 1973. It's some of the oldest fruit um, in the uh, valley, some of the most uh, 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 bespoke mater plant materials are, are, are brought from here. Um, and uh, he does an amazing job. So you can see Steve walking through uh, the vineyard there on the far left. You can see the uh, rest of the family on the far right. It's just truly a family affair. And what I love about um, this wine is, first of all, it chose 17. 17 was a great vintage uh, in this part of the world that followed. Um, 16, which was a much smaller crop. 17 was good. It wasn't without its challenges because it certainly had good quantity and good quality, but um, but it's a, a, a great vintage and, and revered by everybody down there. What's interesting about the Highlands, which Steve will talk about later on when he joins us, is because of this sort of placing, and you're literally just on the other side of the mountain um, from the coast, the Sierra Range, and um, you get some protection, but you do get um, fog and you do get wind. So you get early morning sun, by mid-afternoon, it is blowing um, really hard, and this elongates the growing season. So not only does that early morning sun um, give you extended growing season and ripeness, but because of that wind that you get there, the, uh, the grapes develop thicker skins. They develop a higher concentration of flavor. Um, it elongates the growing season, which is why you always have incredibly lovely acids in the wine. And if you're not familiar with um, Santa Lucia Highlands in general, certainly with their Chardonnays, in particular, although their Pinot Noir should probably get more of the buzz. Um, this is a glorious um, example of one and one that uh, it, it would be done. There's oak on this wine, obviously, but I think it's deftly used. Obviously, it uh, presents itself in a wonderful way, but it's not a you know Chateau two by four. It's not an oak dominated wine. Um, it's blended seamlessly into that. And Steve can talk to us more about that later on. Great. We have some questions here that were sent just to the panel, so I'm going to read them out loud to everybody. Alexander um, saying maybe a possible botrytis on the wine. Did you see that, Evan? Or is that just a virtue of its age? I, I think that, that um, you know, botrytis is always going to be distinguished by a couple of things. You're going to pick up one darker color, and that can certainly be a function of botrytis, particularly with age. But I think it would be even darker than this if it were in a 2017 vintage. Um, botrytis will also give you a very nuanced aroma of honey, like literally honey or honeysuckle, neither of which are particularly prevalent in this wine. You can also pick up some sort of saffrony uh, characters, which again, I'm not particularly finding in this wine. I'm seeing this as being 
very much um, emblematic of the nature of the quality of fruit that they get down there, which gives you this sort of wonderful juxtaposition of ripe tree fruits, some tropical fruits, and then enveloped by just a really good deft use of oak. Um, if there were any Botrytis, and Steve can tell that either, he can answer in the chat really quickly, or he can talk to us a little bit more later on in the happy half hour, um, that would be there, but I don't, I don't think so. And Evan, um, there is a question here from Vanessa, whether it's steel barreled, maybe the acidity and the depth use of oak is making people feel like it's not as oak barreled. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, there's certainly, um, whether this wine is 100% barrel fermented in older and or larger oak is certainly an argument that one could make here. Um, the freshness and the beauty of it would suggest that that there is uh, likely to be, and again, I'll let Steve answer that later on, um, some starting in stainless steel and then moving it to oak barrels, probably in combination with some barrel fermentation later on. But um, no, this wine has definitely seen some oak and the quality of the oak. The seamlessness of the oak would suggest to you that it's quality barrels and not so much any, God forbid, additives, staves or chips or dust or any of that other stuff, which is a much coarser presence of oak, usually held for much uh, less expensive wines. I don't think the oak could be more integrated than it is on this wine. Yeah. Seriously, it is True. like a chef using, you know, just enough salt to the point where the word doesn't even occur to you. And I think that's masterful. Mm -hmm. uh, but Tom, uh, Tim's comments about uh, identification, you know, why not old world, you know, that um, uh, that forward, especially tree fruit element mm -hmm. uh, combined mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is a, a good thumbprint. Yeah, I also think that Evan, you did a really great job uh, picking a 2017 vintage, which is not something that we always see from California, it certainly helps those of us who are trying to understand you know, the, the play of vintage in blind well, tasting. Yeah, and, and, and the beauty is in this particular uh, case, a couple of, of years of bottle age, not only, you know, uh, enabled the color uh, to, to darken appropriately for a wine of this age, but it's also just sort of um, any of the really harshness that you would get with a brand new uh, bottling is sort of polished off here. So you still get ample acidity and bright refreshing acidity at that, but it really allows a lot of the other flavors to meld together. Think about it very much in the way that when you make um, soup, or stew or whatever. It always tastes better like three days later than it did when you initially made it. Think about a really good wine as coming together over time in the bottle, the flavors integrating and melding, uh, the spices of the flavors in the case, the oak coming together there. They are going to be a little bit more um, disjointed and segregated, if you will, like I taste fruit, I taste oak, I'm getting acid when a wine is much younger sim simply upon release. So it also shows you that California Chardonnay is capable of, of aging quite nicely. Five when it's wine. from Great. the Santa Lucia Highlands and yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's from such a deft hand. I was just going to say that's yeah. an ambassador for this region. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Tim, we got to keep moving. <laughs> uh, wine number three, Tim. All right, everybody. Now for something completely different as they say on TV. All right. So uh, as we look at the wine, you know, compared to wine number two, uh, very light color. In fact, this is the lightest of uh, the color in terms of the three white wines. Um, and lots we could say about that. So young, cool climate, lack of oak, lack of uh, skin contact, lack of botrytis, all sorts of things. Uh, in terms of the nose and palate, <clears throat> this is, uh, this is uh, on the nose, a very complex wine. Yeah. Uh, first to note that, you know, my bottles have been open for an hour and 40 minutes now. And this wine, wine number three, still shows sulfur. And I'm sensitive to sulfur, but it still shows it. Okay, so for whatever that's worth. But uh, starting with the fruit, um, I usually go by saying there are five fruit groups in white wine. There's apple and pear, citrus fruit, tropical fruit, stone fruit, and melon, other. And this wine has all of the above, okay? Now, having said that, as your attorney, I would strongly advise you against making decisions based on fruit because it's never enough information. However, I will make an exception by saying this is one grape variety, and there are very few in terms of the white wine world where you have everything. And that's a strong sign here. So in terms of apple and pear, there's green apple, there's Asian pear, uh, there's sweet and tart citrus both, there's mandarin and tangerine and lime and key lime. 
And then there is peach, white peach, white nectarine, uh, pineapple and mango, and then green melon. Hmm, all same glass of wine, <clears throat> excuse me. That makes me think of two grape varieties, okay? Uh, what else for non-fruit? Floral, very pretty floral, white flowers, honeysuckle, uh, apple blossoms, lime blossoms, things like that. Um, herbal, there's a tiny bit of verbena and maybe ginger spice, but that's about it. What there is though is a very pronounced mineral quality to it, stony mineral, slaty mineral, right? And along with that, something that is fusel, uh, a little bit of petroly, and that's TDM, which if you have to know, I'll do it, 116-dimethyl, 1,2-dihydronaphthalene. <laughs> something you did want to know. Okay, yeah, exactly, la, la, la. All right, well, next, there's a complete lack of oak, right? None whatsoever. Um, and we'll discuss that more in a moment. Um, anything else about it? Yeah. Uh, I, kind of I think, think we can show um, the poll uh, for sure as you're, as you're talking okay. about it. I guess we're moving to the poll. <laughs> okay, so here are your four, here's the menu. Here's the four possibilities, three, excuse me. And you've got Chenin Blanc, Riesling and Semillon blend. And then you've got some countries, okay. So, um, you know, I think I've given you a lot of information, but here what you should key on is the fact is uh, the impact compounds, which are usually non-fruit type things, but also keeping in mind, I said all of those fruit families in the same grape slash wine, the TDN, the pronounced mineral quality, the lack of oak. I didn't talk about the structure, but the structure is important here because everybody, I want you again to retaste the wine. I'm going to. And this is so delicious, I'm not spitting it, okay? Mm. My God, that's wonderful wine. First of all, it is slightly sweet, yes? Second of all, the acid is high because wine has more residual sugar than you think. And my salivary glands are freaking out in a really nice way. I can feel the acid in the enamel in my front of the teeth. And now, that, and make sure you do this after you spit the wine out and swallow it, now you can say, oh, and inhale. And I get almost a complete lack of any sense of alcohol, okay? And that is interesting. All right, if you were to do the same thing with the first wine, the Sauvignon Blanc, you'd feel heat because the wine is definitely 14.5 or higher in alcohol. And I would say close to that with the Chardonnay as well, okay? So the structure here is very important. Uh, the panoply, the cornucopia of fruit is important. The TDN is pro important. Uh, high acid, low alcohol. Okay, with that, I just threw you a fastball right over the plate. And man, am I glad baseball season is on. I don't know about you, Evan. Very. <laughs> Go Giants. All right, so let's have the results, please, Lee Man. Absolutely. There we go. So a lot of people took my very uh, subtle telegraphing of... <laughs> markers for Riesling. Okay, good. And then went to most of you went to Germany, some of you went to France. All right, so let's, you know, go ahead and uh, do the Google map, which is, again, like Maddie, it's my favorite part of all this. And it's a place I've been six times before, the Mosul, and the winery Fitzhog, I've been three times. And uh, the amazing Glom Hog, the owner who, you know, when he shakes your hand, he almost breaks it. It's very German. And then his son, Oliver, who's also the owner and winemaker at Schloss Lieser, is now the winemaker. So here you're in Braunerberg, which is in the middle Mosul. And it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, can we see the pictures of the vineyards? You can see the, the map. And uh, we got to sh show the pictures because uh, they're just gorgeous. So you're looking southwest. That is the, the Braunerberg Ufer vineyard. What you can't see is that there's a sundial to the right. And that's a small subsection of the vineyard called uh, Ufer Zonenar. Zonenar means sundial. Uh, I'm really not sure how old this vineyard is, how long it's been cultivated. If you drive just 10 minutes uh, upriver to Valen and the Valen or Zonenar, that is the oldest vineyard on earth in terms of cultivation. It's been in uh, operation for 2000 years. Here, you know, probably a 55 degree slope. These vineyards, they're all Riesling. It faces east, southeast, um, has to be worked by hand. Everything has to be done by hand. Uh, what else can we say about it? 100% um, Riesling. 
Uh, you know, the winery uses a combination of stainless steel and larger cooperage, uh, what are called pudras. There are a thousand liters, and some of them are well over 100 years old. Uh, they use the stainless steel for uh, uh, the estate Rieslings, both fruity and dry, the Trocken wines, and then they use the larger cooperage for the Predicat wines, like Spätlaser, Auslaser. One more thing I'll tack in about this, this wine seems delicate and, you know, kind of like a wallflower, but I want you to know the oldest unfortified white wine I've ever tasted was a Mosel Spätlaser Riesling from Peace Porta Gold Truption, and it was a hundred years, it was, excuse me, 80 years old at the time. So, these wines from a top pedigree vineyard producer uh, vineyard like this can age easily 30 to 40 years and they're remarkable. Okay. So questions, questions. Um, first of all, for those of you who are, who are oh, not no. familiar with this, if you took the sleeve off, you will actually have the actual back label information with the alcohol content. So this is an 8%. Um, Tim, first question, what helped you land in Germany versus Alsace? Is it the alcohol level? This is a question from Colleen. Yeah, Colleen, exactly. You know, you know, Alsace Riesling is going to be at least 12% alcohol. And usually if it has residual sugar, it's going to be higher. And more often than not, there's going to be botrytis. Yeah, the acid is still going to be there, but it's going to be a much richer wine. And also more often than not, there's exceptions, of course. You know, it's going to be earthy as well as minerally but it's gonna be a much richer wine. Uh, what else on here? Uh, too sweet for Alsace? Well, you can have sweeter Rieslings in Alsace too. Uh, what else? Margaret is asking, distinguished from Spanish Moscato. Well, you know, Muscat, uh, Margaret is a fully aromatic grape, so it is really floral and also is gonna have a lot of phenolic bitterness. This has almost none. And what else? The Moscato is gonna have higher alcohol. Again, everybody, I want you to realize, I mean, 8% alcohol, and, you know, once upon a time, 20 years ago, that was 7% alcohol. So uh, mm -hmm. that is the beauty of these wines. Yeah. And you know what it's that hard means? hard to believe, you Tim, can, that it's You can drink a 8%. whole bottle by yourself watching Monday Night Football. And I've <laughs> never done that. <laughs> now, Tim, um, on this Spanish Moscato, the Spanish Moscato also does not have that TDN factor that this wine has, right? Uh, Moscato can have TDN, but it's not going to be like this. And you know, the TDN, the petrofusal thing is here really light. In Muscat, in Alsace Muscat, you do find it, but that's in a much richer wine, you know? And again, Alsace, and remember Evan pointed this out a few minutes ago, this TDN thing really happens in places that have shorter growing seasons where it's sunny. That's really where it develops in wine. Okay. Great. It's important to know. Isn't this done. wine lovely? Oh, it's, go it. it's gorgeous. It. It's gorgeous. It is important to note um, that in addition to, you mentioned that, 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 that correctly, that there are um, sweet uh, examples of Riesling and other varieties in Alsace. They are relatively rare, you know, so unless you see yep. specifically notated uh, Vendage Tardive, which means late harvest on the label or Selection des Grands Nobles, which is essentially sort of an Auschleza level uh, bottling for, for Alsace wines, that's going to be it. The rest of them are, are dry. Um, they've actually changed the laws because people were starting to sneak sugar into their Alsace wines earlier, but they've changed the law back to uh, really um, push them to be dry. So if you're going to get generosity of, of weight, alcohol, dryness, and that varietal character, which is sort of like, yeah, I think it's Riesling, but, but, but you're probably not going to end up in Germany. Would that be a safe yeah. assumption? Plus the sweet. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The yeah, one more thought. Thing. Yeah, I want to connect the dots here before we move on, Lee Meg. When I mentioned, you know, there are two great varieties for me where if more often than not, you come across an expression of fruit in all five of those fruit categories. The other one is Chenin Blanc from the Loire Valley, uh, mm -hmm. especially Vouvray and Minitou Salon. And both of those wines, sometimes you get everything. And the difference is going to be with uh, something like Vouvray Demi Sec, higher alcohol, the high acid, uh, you know, and just a totally different mineral, a chalky mineral versus a slate mineral. But it's a it's a richer, bigger wine. Okay, are we ready for wine number four? Absolutely, ready for some red wine for those yeah, of you. Absolutely, probably want a new glass off, from that last wine. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're starting off with an absolutely wonderful wine too. Uh, we were talking, you know, before we started, and we think just that this, this flight is filled with gorgeous examples of what these wines are, true to type. Okay, wine four, no exception. 
Um, as you tilt your glass forward and you're looking at it, uh, you've got a red color, ruby, but you've also got an evolved. So it's ruby with some garnet, okay? And that to me signifies could be some age, could be some extended time in oak, could be the grape variety, or it could be some oxidative winemaking. So we will find out, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Uh, and then these questions, again, see-through, opaque, and what does that suggest? Okay, it suggests really a family or kind of grape varieties, some red wines, grapes, lighter pigmented, lighter color, others, you know, just the opposite. How do you describe the effect of oak barrels and red wines aroma? Well, in any wines aroma, you've got vanilla from the vanillin in the wood, and you have any number of different spices. You have coffee, tea, bitter chocolate, you know, a lot of different things are oak markers. And then finally, the tannin quality is the tannin harsh or pleasantly drying. And that points to either the oak usage itself was the oak used versus new, or how old is the wine? And for that matter, uh, how, old is, how old was the oak and how long did it stay in the oak? So lots of uh, variables. Okay, moving on. Oh, this smells fabulous. Okay, dominant here thing is red fruit, first of all, and it's dry, it's fresh, not quite fresh, it's fresh and ripe and dry, but predominantly dry. So sour cherry is the first thing that pops to me, uh, some dried red plum bordering on prune. There's also dried cherry tomatoes, uh, but things that are sour. I'd also put some pomegranate in there too, something that is sour and tannic. Um, there's some black fruit, but it again is dried. And I would say something along the lines of plum kind of fits the bill. This wine to me, though, is all about the non-fruit, the other than fruit category, starting with the floral, uh, with your nose above the glass, it's predominantly dried flowers. So mm, I have to stop and be an Eagle Montoya and, and sum this up. You take a look at the color, it's evolved. That means more often than not that everything else about the wine is going to be evolved. So you have dried flowers as opposed to fresh flowers. And then I just mentioned dried fruit as opposed to fresh ripe fruit, okay? And you know, the other wines may show us a lot more youth and freshness, that's possible. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. so here, this wine is evolving. Okay, with that, I get things like dried rose petals. Uh, in terms of non-fruit, I get tomato leaves, dried star anise, dried, what else have I got here? Uh, I wanna say that there's a little dried orange peel and tangerine peel, right? What else? Um, dried red peppers, tomato leaf, tobacco leaf, and then dried laurel, okay? The wine is very earthy. It's predominantly earthy, but there's also minerals. So there's mushrooms, there's turned soil. It almost smells like baked terracotta, hot terracotta tiles. Uh, and the oak aging here is used. It's very low intensity, but there's definitely an oxidative, you know, walnut skin type character. And, uh, and then everybody, you know, one of the first things that popped out of the glass, there's definitely some volatile acidity. There's some balsamic type vinegar. And where do you smell for that? Smell at the top of the glass because it's volatile. It rises very quickly. All right. In terms of the structure, I have medium alcohol, medium plus plus acid. I really feel it all over. And tannin, I would say medium plus and finishes long and it's just wonderfully complex wine. Okay, there you are. There is the, uh, the ballot and you can cast your votes. Vote early, vote okay. often if you were in Chicago, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Again, it's anonymous. So I hope people will just put themselves out there, uh, take a stand, mm. if you will. If you don't vote, like it's, it's, yeah, say if, if you don't, if we don't get enough votes, it's hard for us to know where people thought. So we can't, there's nothing to talk about. Yep. So, aha, uh -huh, oh, here we go. That, Tim. All right. So we've got Carbonara and Blend, Sangiovese Blend, Tempranillo Blend, and Old World in Italy. Okay. So I think, first of all, you know, those of you that voted for Carbonara, you know, keep in mind the fact that Carbonara is Cabernet Sauvignon family, and it's probably the most shamelessly pyrazinic member of the Cabernet family, mm -hmm. right? It is green peppercorns. And, and just very green and pyrazinic. Uh, Sangiovese here, I think is a wonderful call just because the wine is bone dry, high acid, has both grape and oak tannin. And every, a lot of people went to Italy. Why not Tempranillo blend? Um, because Tempranillo compared to Sangiovese is like the red grape family stereo, but the volume turned down. It's just not mm -hmm. as acidic. It's not as tannic. Uh, 
Uh, and I would ex actually expect it, if it was similar in quality, to be more oxidative and involved. Okay. And oakier. Yeah, you're right. Good point, Maddie. Oakier. Okay. So let's put on the seat belts and let's see where we end up. A place where if you have a glass of wine in your hand and you're not happy, you may be the one with issues. <laughs> All right, we're ah, in Tuscany, God's Tuscana. country. Yeah, and we're in the uh, village of Montalcino. And there are several of them in Tuscany and they're built on some of them from the Renaissance, some of them from the Middle Ages like Montepulciano and San Gimignano. And you, in, in the case of Montalcino, you can see literally probably 50 square miles around. Um, it's uh, the wines here are made from 100% Sangiovese. The clone there is Sangiovese Grosso. You should also know there's actually a clone called Sangiovese Piccolo, meaning small Sangiovese, right? Same place. Uh, it was a clone that was isolated by Biondi Santi family in the 1850s, I think, right around the time that Garibaldi was trying to make Italy into a country. Here, this is Rosso di Montalcino. So this is either Young Vines or Declassified uh, Brunello di Montalcino. Whereas Brunello can't be released until five years after the vintage. Uh, Rosso only needs to be aged for a year and oak is not even required. Uh, I will tell you, this is one of my favorite value red wines anywhere because if you look to the best Brunello producers and Altacino is you know, right at the top of my list, uh, you're gonna get some incredible wine for a fraction of the cost of Brunello. The other thing I need to tell you is that, you know, Brunello, you know, obviously it's that hilltop village, which, by the way, has more wine shops per capita than you can possibly believe. And <laughs> the wines are no cheaper there. They're expensive there. Go figure. Anyway, but it's surrounded by vineyards. In fact, the vineyard area is all planted and you can't plant a new vineyard. You can't. If you want to buy a vineyard, you can do that, but you can't plant a new one. Uh, what else about it? The soil varies dramatically and the soil on the north side, which is where Altacino is, uh, the vineyards are planted higher in altitude and the soil is calcareous and it's chalky, right? So to me, the wine's very lifted and does have a certain dusty quality to it. Whereas on the other side and the south and southwest, it's lower in altitude and there's more clay and marl. And the wines tend to be richer and broader and more earthy versus mineral. To me, you know, Brunello is like the Burgundy of Tuscany and that the wines 100% of the grape and they really show the soil more than anything. And there is the owner, fantastic. One thing I do wanna do if it's okay, real fast crash course for those of you who are, as Evan says, Jedi Knights in training. You know, how do you tell the difference between Chianti Classico, uh, Brunello di Montalcino, and Vino Nobile di Montepulciano? Okay, let's start with Brunello. It's the oldest wine by law by the time you get it. It's five years old. It's also the most oxidative, okay? So there's nothing fresh about it. And more often than not, it has the most oak, and it could be the most tannic. Chianti Classico is somewhere in between. The wines only have to be two years before the release, reserve it three years, and then 36 months, I think, for Gran Selezione. Uh, more often than not, they're two 100% Sangiovese, but not usually. There can even be Merlot, Syrah, et cetera. And more often than not, they're in small French barriques. So they really show a lot of new oak character. Now we go to Vino Noble de Montepulciano you can have up to 30% other grapes in there and people almost always do. It's rare that you find a Vino Noble that's 100%. And to me, the quality there is the most variable uh, and the use of oak is all over the map. Some people use barriques, some people use old chestnut and other kinds of oak. So again, that should help you. That's kind of a little primer on Sangiovese. Okay. Tim, can, can I uh, be on, uh, in your slipstream and overstate the obvious, you know, because what you just said, I took notes, by the way, you know, we learn from each other, okay. seriously. But, you know, when you're talking, when you're struggling between Sangiovese, Tempranino and Nebbiolo, which is Jedi and Knight trainings, you know, nightmare Kobayashi Maru scenario, right? <laughs> here's, here's my little C-spot run version of it. Sangiovese. Bands of color, like Tim said, you have that central ruby, but then not only do you have a yellow or orange hue, but you've got several hues between the center and the rim that can happen with Nebbiolo. However, that beautiful, poignant, 
equal tension between acid and tannin speaks to me, Sandra Beza, versus Nebbiolo just surging ahead in the structure mm. of, uh, you know, uh, and also what Tim said too, the dry, dry, dry fruit and flowers, which can come into play with Nebbiolo as well, but that acid tannin balance, don't you think, Tim? It's such a yeah, fingerprint absolutely. for San Giovese. Yeah. Thank you for your little master class, by the way. <laughs> yeah, can I also say that I had, the time I went there, and this is almost 10 years ago, we had lunch of Il Poggioni, also a fantastic producer, and I had one of the greatest desserts I've ever had. It was chestnut gelato, chestnut gelato covered in local honey with slices of black truffle. Ooh. You described this wine so well that Phil got it without the wine in front of him. Cha -ching. There you go. Way to go, Phil. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Let's go on to wine number five. Evan, back to you. Yeah, uh, I, I just literally finished my entire glass of wine for the other thing that I think it's a delightful wine. Um, the other thing that's important to note that Tim brought up, and just as a closing point there, is that Sangiovese and Nebbiolo both, but particularly Sangiovese to me, drops color quite quickly. So it's not unusual that you're going to start to see that sort of garneting or ambering or coppering around the edge in a young wine. And that's not poor storage. That's not weirdness. That's just right. the nature of the grape variety. Some grapes simply drop color faster, and Sangiovese is right up there. So as soon as I see a, a fairly translucent wine with a little bit of oranging there. That's something I keep in the back of my mind is, aha, what are the grapes yep. that drop color? Because that's going to come out and help me a little bit later. So, all right, let's pick up our next glass. So right off the bat, if you look at this wine, um, it's a very different uh, appearance, right? So it's much more uh, it, deeper. Um, it, 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 I wouldn't call it by any means opaque, but certainly compared to the last wine, it's got much more richness of color. It's more in that sort of classic ruby uh, vein of things with more of a faded rubiness to it, a little bit of crimson uh, character in there, a soft um, uh, amount of extraction. So I'm getting a light, uh, I wouldn't say tearing that's there, but I'm getting sort of a sheen of pink around my glass a little bit as I swirl it around. My tears are um, pleasant, uh, moderate um, on the thinner side. So I'm not expecting as big a wine and they do run a little bit quicker than my first glass that I talked to you about earlier, wine two did, all to keep in mind. Right off the bat in the nose, mm, very elegant wine. Um, that's one of the things, things that it hits me is just the elegance about this wine. All right, fruit, what do we have? We have a combination of red and black fruit, probably more red than black in my esteem. Uh, red currants, um, red berries a little bit. There's a an earthiness to it, um, sort of a uh, leafiness to the wine as well too. Um, can be some dried leaves, could be uh, tobacco leaves, could be pipe tobacco, something like that. The very soft um, mineral character that perhaps pushes some people to that vein of, of, of sort of a cedary graphite-ish nature or something like that, uh, and a very matte tone, um, which is to say that the fruit isn't necessarily per se vibrant and jumping at you. It's the difference between from the old days of those of you who used to get your prints uh, when, you, when you printed your own uh, pictures and we had a choice of going glossy print or matte print. Um, this is matte, it's not glossy. Everything's just a, bit, a little bit softer and dare I say, uh, dare I say foggier. Um, earthiness is there, wood's there, um, definitely present. There's some oak elements to it, but nothing stands out. Once again, more just um, a frame around the wine, but not something that says, hey, look at me, I'm a big oaky barrel or anything like that. In the mouth. The wine is again, I would say elegant, but the attack is, is uh, moderately soft there. There's definitely tannin, but the tannins themselves are polished. It could be a function of tannin management. It could be a function of time in the barrel. It could be a, a function of fining of the wine. Uh, but everything about this wine just um, exudes elegance to me. It, it's just lovely. The structure of the wine is smooth and round. Uh, I would say its alcohol level is probably uh, medium plus, if anything, leaning slightly more towards medium than high. Uh, the acid level is balanced. Um, the tannins themselves are medium to medium plus, probably medium plus, but softened with a little bit of age over time. The finish on it is medium plus, and the wine is um, delightful. I would say for me personally, um, it's probably at its apogee right about now. I think you could hold this wine for a few more years, but I think it's drinking beautifully as we speak. 
as far as where we could go with it. First of all, one of the things I do note about this wine oh. in absolute contrast to the first four wines that really speak to me as singularity, singularity of grape type, singularity of voice. This one's got lots of different things going on. So I would say regardless of what grape you land on, it definitely comes off as being blended, which is to say a little bit of a few other elements there contributing something rather than the purity of voice that I think you saw in the first four wines. Whether that's Cabernet and the Cabernet family by nature, which is going to be as much driven by its structure, uh, as well as obviously its location and all those other things. Merlot, part of that same family, but by definition softer, more approachable by nature. Syrah, a little bit bolder, more flavorful uh, by nature, but can be softened with time as well. And then appropriately, old worlding and new worlding matching it, depending on which great choice you have chosen. Great. All right. I wonder how uh, turned around people are by now, because we've got we've we've kind of gone everywhere in the world right now. That's the whole goal of these things is around the world, yeah. around the world. And this will take us yet somewhere else. So um, right back, Phil, I assume he means speaking to Bordeaux, Bordeaux being down in southwest France, as opposed to, say, Wells Fargo versus B of A. Right. One being right, the other one being wrong. I don't know. Uh, but definitely can show some things of that family for sure. And um, we'll have to see where it takes us. But everyone should be voting. Um, left more cab. Yeah, quite possibly. Quite possibly. And um, yeah, thank you for playing, everybody. These games are a lot more fun when people play. And again, regardless of whether you got it right or wrong, is far less important than the discussion and the um, uh, narrative that we have here. So we're if, if you add the two of those things together, let me see if I can add up in my head, 43 plus 29, three quarters of you are definitely in the world of what we would call Bordeaux varieties. Whether you picked Cabernet as your lead uh, on this or Merlot as your lead, you did pick those. A few people in Syrah and a few other people, well, maybe a few people thought about other but didn't want to vote. Everybody pretty much um, is in France, a couple of you pick Chile, that would be totally appropriate because the second largest producer of uh, Cabernet in the world outside of Bordeaux is in fact Chile. So if you did think Cabernet, that would be a good place to go. There's also a lot of Merlot in Chile as well. New World Australia certainly has a good amount of uh, those varieties in it, probably more Cabernet than Merlot. Merlot is more of a moderate uh, blending grape down there. But the Cabernet that's there um, can go in one of two places. If you were going to pick New World Australia for Cabernet based wine, I'd probably say you wanted to pick a cooler place. I would probably go Western Australia, probably more Margaret River, um, Perth, that area where the Cabernets tend to be more Bordeaux-like by definition, rather than the sort of heavier, big Kunawara stuff you find more towards uh, the central part of the country. So should we get on the uh, Google Earth thing? I'm gonna hold the table once again. I swear to God, I do get vertigo when we do this. So this. we're moving around. And we're moving, um, we we're just in the old world in Italy and we're coming back. We're gonna stay in the old world and we're gonna go to France and we're gonna go to Bordeaux and we are gonna go to Wells Fargo. Now we are gonna go to the right bank of France as opposed to the left bank and in the greater area of Saint-Emilion. And this uh, particular um, project, like so many um, in the area of Saint-Emilion in the, uh, and that is a Merlot driven wine. So what would give this away is Merlot, probably the softness of the tannins, the soft herbal characters. For those of you who are picking up some green notes there, we talked a little bit about tobacco, we talked about bay leaf, we talked about some of those other things, just an overall leafiness, which comes from um, Merlot, but particularly Merlot that's enhanced with Cabernet Franc for which this wine is. Now, for those of you, who are not necessarily familiar with this particular wine, Legende, which comes from Saint-Emilion, you are probably familiar with the producer. These guys named Domaine Baron de Rothschild, the owners of Lafitte Rothschild, have been making wines since the 1860s, 1868 to be specific. And then um, some 130 something years later, they decided that not everybody in the world could afford uh, Lafitte Rothschild. Not everybody in the world could necessarily even afford Duart Milan or L'Evangile. And um, 
um, led actually by their winemaker, Diane Flamand, um, senior winemaker now, um, they embarked on this plan to produce wines that were very true to place, but made in one, a more approachable style, since many of the classic Bordeaux you need to put in your cellar for 30 years before you want to drink them, and two wines that really spoke to um, an ease of enjoyability um, the way Bordeaux can be, either in smaller growth, smaller chateaus, or whether vinified at the same. So they came up with this entire line called Légende, which means legend. And they're really all about sort of a more modern, um, less need to be in the cellar drinkability style. Uh, this comes from Saint-Emilion, whereas the, um, they, make an, they make five different wines. The uh, Medoc wine and the Poyac wine that they make are all from their own vineyards. This wine is what I would call a negociant wine, a negociant wine in the sense that they have a deal with a single supplier. And much as I did my sleuthing, I couldn't find out who it was and, and nobody at the importer that I could offer money to would tell me. Uh, but clearly they have a pedigreed uh, supplier in saint Emilion with whom they purchase a wine slash fruit from and blend this wine here. As I said before, it's about 85 to 90% Merlot and a kiss of Cabernet Franc. Uh, it's a wine that I think is at, at its absolute apogee right now. I think it'll hold for a few more years, but it's gorgeous. It speaks to Bordeaux. It speaks to that combination of earth, current, fruit, tobacco, uh, a little bit of, uh, of death, sort of a cedary oak to it um, and just expressive, approachable, um, yummy. Uh, and uh, for Bordeaux, and again, it's all relative in Bordeaux, um, affordable for Bordeaux these days, which is uh, particularly with something coming from the pedigreed house of uh, Baron de Rothschild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the back of our label here also gives you the percentage breakdown of Merlot versus Cabernet Franc. So for those of you who doesn't, who don't want to go to the screen to pull down the tasting note, you can see on the back of the label, it's 95% Merlot, 5% Cabernet Franc. Um, with that, hey, I got it right. <laughs> uh, Madeline, uh, let's have you finish up the last wine. Maddie, did we lose you? Oh, you didn't oh, lose me. Yeah. I'm, I'm struggling to unmute. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any of you tech people remain calm. You know, you're worth your weight in gold because people like me still struggle with basic stuff. Um, my PS to Evan's uh, beautiful description of that wine, it's very polished, you know, and yeah. it speaks to that. That lady looks like she makes wine for Lafitte. <laughs> you know? And uh, it's reflected in, in the wine. I mean that in the best possible way. It's a, a beautiful polished expression, certainly not rustic, of a Merlot dominant Bordeaux blend. Uh, congrats on getting your hands on it, Evan. Yay. Okay, wine number six. Yay, I'm the caboose. I love being the caboose. So, we're looking at the color, which we've all determined is not unimportant, right? Um, and this to me looks like a, a dark ruby red verging on opaque. I can sort of see my finger through it, um, but you know, I certainly can't read. And then when I let my eye travel from the center, which is a dark ruby red to the very rim, there's um, either a just lighter reflection. So it's monochromatic of the center color, but maybe even a little bit of violet in it, which speaks to, um, youth, correct? Um, always interesting when you're deducing. And again, to Evan's point, hold the thought that some grapes bleed color uh, faster than other grapes. So um, does, it, um, uh, does it stay in the glass? Don't forget to just turn the glass, right? And look at it against a white surface. And it does. I mean, the stain is not, you're not painting the walls purple, but it certainly speaks to a grape variety that probably um, has a thicker skin and a little more extract going on here. So um, aromatic, I've always said to people who get um, um, really locked when it comes to their initial or final conclusions and deductive tasting that go back to the color, it will often set you free, <laughs> right? So that said, uh, I did, I have been playing with both the, uh, the nose and the flavor, so I'll speak to both of them, but. I'm going back to the aroma for a moment. And I think there's this, um, you know, red, red fruit leads here, um, you know, in the way of red raspberry, red plum with, you know, sort of the, um, the chorus coming in with a little black raspberry and black cherry as well. And the big difference is no, there's nothing wrong in comparing wines if you're trying to clarify 
um, the, the qualification of say fruit or florals or herbs in your mind, you can compare to um, the Sangiovese where you had all that dry, dried fruit. And this is more of a fresh expression of red plum, red plum, red raspberry, some black raspberry and black cherry. And also the florals are fresh, not dried to me. Um, I loved the, the comment um, to pivot back to the Sangiovese for a moment about perceiving volatile acidity, acidity that it's at the top of the glass because sometimes I don't catch it because I'm old enough that I've been tasting wines long enough that were riddled with VA. So I think I probably um, forgive it. I'm gonna take it on the palate real quick. I, sm I swallowed that little son of a gun because I wanna share a term that me and my colleagues use with some regularity, but don't define. This wine is all about mid palate to me, especially when it comes to deducing and concluding what it is. Because there's the red plum, there's the red raspberry, there's the black raspberry, black cherry, there's the lavender, um, fresh, a little bit of a green element in the incarnation of maybe olive, a little bitter arugula and some anise, maybe a little bit of mint, but mid palate, the flavor that is just singing such a clear song is meat. Um, to, and this is the vegan vegetarian talking Jimmy Dean, you know, <laughs> and it's not just meat, it's peppered meat. You know, so you get um, this very clear flavor of, but it's not dominant. It doesn't bury the wine. It doesn't make it a one note wonder. It simply is um, distinct. It is smoked meat that's been peppered either with white or black pepper. And then does, um, please play with the, um, the poll while I'm um, uh, defining a little bit what I'm perceiving. Uh, oak intensity is moderate on this wine, much like the Chardonnay wine number two, the oak use is so deft that it's a non-issue. It happens to be an element if I pay really close attention to it. I'm certainly not getting a wall of vanilla or Starbucks, you know, cocoa and, um, you know, fresh baking spices. Um, so what we would call in wine speak blended oak. The tannins are soft by anybody's measure. They're present, rub your tongue against the roof of your mouth. It's not acid, it's not tannin deficient. And the acidity is definitely making my mouth water, uh, but the tannins are gentle and it is long. I think this wine has a terrific um, life ahead of itself. What are our options that we're looking at? Grenache blend, Syrah blend, Malbec blend. Um, you know, go to Malbec first. You know, the color um, on Malbec is often, not always, often deeper than this, more opaque. Um, the fruits will veer more into black and blueberry. And there is florality on this wine, which is, you know, uh, if it's not present in a big way in Malbec is big time disappointing. So I would say, you know, were I tasting this wine um, double blind, the struggle for me would be uh, on a primal level between Grenache dominant blend or a Syrah dominant blend, or maybe even mono varietal. Um, old world, new world, again, um, with simple strokes. Is there an earthy to this, earthiness to this wine? Absolutely, both organic and inorganic, but it doesn't lead. It is um, a back note or a side uh, note. Uh, I think it's positively delicious, but if I pull back for a moment and describe the punchlines to this wine for me, mid palate peppered meatiness, aromatically ripe red plum and red raspberry, soft tannins, which could be misleading. Um, the color is young and um, it's delicious, ripe, balanced. Uh, and with, it is, it does have complexity, but I think it will absolutely gain more as time goes on. The quality of fruit on this is terrific. And note to self, here we have, this seems to be a sub-theme of today's 127A kit, where we have ripeness, but we have freshness. This combination of grapes that are getting, you know, hang time, but are not being, you know, um, uh, crushed by excessive levels of, uh, of heat. So, okay, are we revealing? Hey, I think we can go to where we are in the world. Hmm. If you can't tell that the three of us love wine, you know, <laughs> we've been at it longer than we're going to tell anybody. And we adore Absolutely. wine. And we have a strong vote for Syrah with um, 
uh, a pretty strong vote for Grenache. And then we're taking my favorite ride on um, Google Earth 2. We are in Victoria. So we're Southeastern Australia, not South Australia. We're at a very famous historic winery called Best. Best. And um, this is actually from, um, you know, this is not um, Yarra Valley. It's not Rutherglen. You know, just a reminder, Australia and wine growing regions are big. This is in um, Western Victoria. It is um, the, uh, I believe, zone, correct, of uh, Grampians that used to be called Great Western. And now Great Western is actually a subdistrict of Grampians. I had to like rattle my head around to get this. Very interesting climate here. Because, you know, you might think, cool climate, period, end of story, not so fast. Because you have big time diurnal swings here. You have little or no maritime influence because it's uh, what, two and a half hours from, from Melbourne, it's inland, but you have altitude, altitude working um, for it and you've got warm to even hot um, days, but significant uh, diurnal swings at night. I love telling consumers about diurnal swings because it's such a sexy wine term uh, to use. Um, these folks best have some of the oldest historic vines um, in Austra in the world, period. I mean, actually they planted their first vines um, in the 1860s. Their winery was functioning by 1869. Best has been owned by two um, uh, families from uh, actually Great Britain uh, for a long period of time. And I think they're only bested by what Langmeal, uh, who have uh, has the oldest Syrah vineyard in the world, <laughs> dating back to the 1840s. Um, and you can see that we've got, uh, you know, mixed oak at play here, right? What we call blended oak. Um, the takeaway for me is that this is just, you know, beautifully crafted, New World Syrah Shiraz by anybody's measure. It takes a gun and shoots this conventional wisdom of writing off Aussie Shiraz as being a one note wonder or something that you can generalize about. This is absolutely not South Australia. We are not in the Barassa Valley, right? Um, we, you know, you, you could even struggle with, is this old world? You know, where does it come from? But um, note to self, for those of you who are really committed to deducing wine, if it doesn't speak to you um, on the first whiff, which you can never rely on, that mid palate expression of meat and pepper makes you consider Syrah in a very committed way, strong way. However, I will say my parting shot on the, um, the struggle between Grenache and Syrah, Grenache rarely has that meaty expression, though it often has an even more pronounced expression of pepper and the color will often be more translucent, okay, than Syrah. And here, I love the, the guy in the middle is Viv. Isn't that cool? And he's hanging on and he's still kicking with uh, um, his family member, member Ben. So the Thompsons and the Bests um, are the two families behind Bests and uh, their young winemaker, Justin. I think this is also, to your point, Madeline, um, can be an eye opener. I, I actually, this is my two, amongst my favorite Syrazes coming out of Australia are both from this area. So I think this, this is a, a high on my list. The other one for those people that love that sort of super rotundon peppery thing, Mount Langi Giron is also from the Gamp Grampians and is probably amongst the most peppery Shirazes on this earth, regardless of whether it happens to be from Australia, France, or anywhere else. But if you happen to find yourself um, seeking out alternatives to the otherwise very extracted, at times, dare I say, syrupy versions of certain Shirazes coming out of warmer climate, Australia, find some of these other areas. The Canberra wine, some of you might remember that we had a few oh, weeks beautiful. ago from Clonakilla would be one here in the Grampians. Um, again, Bess or, or, or um, uh, Mount Langi Giron would be another example. They can make those wines too. So. This, this does this noble grape variety justice, don't you think, Tim? Oh, without a doubt. You know, I also, and this is totally editorial, um, I think the Australians, generally speaking, do tannin management in red wines as good or better than anyone else on the planet. Huh. And this is a perfect example. It starts in the vineyard and then, you know, the, their use of oak and especially their fining regimens with the wines, I think they do that 
as well as anyone. They were also, and I don't want to confuse the issue, but I need to bring it up. They were also the ones who figured out that you could actually add tannin to red wine to make it smoother. <laughs> and they yeah. figured that out a long time ago and they do it. And now everybody does it, so. So yeah. we have come to the end of our session here. Uh, we have a couple of things to announce for next month. So we have skipped 128A. So don't be shocked if what you're getting in your monthly shipment is 129A. Um, for better or for worse, we've had a buyer who bought up all the 128s before we could get them out to you guys. So uh, we, will, we will come back to some of those wines in 128 at a later date, but we are going straight to 129 and we're super excited about 129. Um, that said, it is unfortunately a very packed day on April 15th. I hope most of you can join us. For better or for worse, it is Good Friday and um, Passover Arif for those of you who celebrate Passover. So I know I'll be cooking and <laughs> getting ready and for finishing your taxes. a webinar. <laughs> exactly. And finishing your taxes. What a packed day. Um, and then, of course, we have a new webinar, an extra webinar a week before that for Fapiano's 125th anniversary kit. Uh, we are here hosted by Fapiano, Master of the World is here in Healdsburg, and we wanted to make a very fun kit for them. Uh, and we have some very fun wines, including a 1993 uh, Petit Syrah, which is wow. what Fapiano is famous for. Um, for those of you who are on this uh, webinar, we have a 30% off code for you. Um, and only share during this webinar, because as you know, we don't do a lot of discounts of our tasting kits. Our margins are already so tight. Um, and this one's a really fun one, Evan. Talk a little bit about this food and wine pairing element that you and Nova are going to be doing. Yeah, no, this one's going to be more about, I don't want to say it's, it's not about Fapiano and it's really more about food and wine, but it's going to be much more informal. We're going to talk a little bit about thoughts on pairing wine and food together using the six wines that are in the kit, which are far ranging in style as um, uh, opportunities to, to talk about a little bit of food. So we're going to encourage people to bring dishes there and um, or bring some food to, to, to join along with. We actually will have, if you apply, I don't know if it's going to be on our thing as well too, but if you sign up through Fapiano, I know they're going to have a quick little shopping list um, that you could people can purchase through Amazon of elements that we will have with us. So you can actually have not only the same wine at the same time as we're doing it, but even the same foods or similar foods too. Yeah, we'll be sending that out to anyone who purchases the kit. We'll send you a shopping list so that uh, whether it's in your home already, or if you want to buy from Amazon, you'll have the kind of wines and foods that we'll be tasting together. So that will be a very, um, Evan is the expert on food and wine pairing. So this is definitely going to be a huge treat. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're so excited that you took the time on this Monday afternoon to join us Monday evening for those of you on the East Coast. Uh, Tim, uh, Evan and Madeline are going to stay. And of course, we have Steve McIntyre and his gang um, also as a special guest in our happy half hour. I will be listening in. I will be off camera because unfortunately, we've got three people sick here at the winery today. So we will be, uh, I will be pitching in. But for those of you who are going to stay, Evan and Madeline and Tim will be your hosts and be ready to share um, Steve McIntyre with you. Um, Andrea, thank you very much for pulling the deck together. Um, she will also be promoting you guys. For those of you who want, just raise your hand and we will promote you to panelists so that you can show your camera as well.